Okay, now I am officially bugged. It's good to be with you, and I was tickled to, let, to death when uh, not long ago I got the invitation to come and speak before you for a few days. There was an earlier appointment right when the so-called pandemic was at its height, and uh, so things were delayed, but it's been a number of years uh, since I've met with most of you, in fact, Probably most of the congregations that I've known over the years, most of the members have moved on somewhere else on this earth or have actually moved to another world. But you've been near and dear to me for many years, and also you've supported me uh, from, I believe, before the time that I started a family. I had... Uh, I was pushed into preaching originally, and uh, it's just the idea that preachers for four, uh, small congregations were hard to come by, and uh, I, I've stuck with that over the years, but I was wondering, could I even support a family? And uh, so you were one of the congregations I contacted. You have supported me, I believe, since 94, 93, somewhere in there. No, I think since uh, probably around 91 thereabouts, and um, what I was able to do is to fulfill two goals. One is to put a lot of time into the research and preaching and teaching of the Word of God and support a family. Uh, for a bachelor to decide, oh, you know, I can, I can live wherever and get by, well, that's one thing, but to make that decision for a wife and the offspring, I decided, well, I don't think my children and family should be uh, subjected to poverty just because the head of the household is a preacher. But y'all have supported me continuously since then, except for the brief periods when I've said, you know, uh, discontinued the support for at least a while. That means a lot more to me than dollars and cents. Uh, for some reason, you've trusted me, and I am very honored by that, and it puts the pressure on me to prove that I deserve that trust. But it's good to be back with you and to spend uh, a few days in talking about different things from the Word of God. To set the tempo and the mood for the week, I'd like to start, well, I put the title on this lesson, let's start at the beginning. And so I did, I made it. I showed up in a little economy car and it didn't have a lot of stuff, a lot of room, and uh, beyond that, there's not a lot with me. In other words, I got off without any carpenter tools, and so I'm, I'm ill-equipped to fix your leaky roof or to tighten down a squeaky floorboard. I didn't bring a medicine bag to treat the sick folks. No surgical instruments, no vaccine serums. Uh, well, for that matter, I don't even own a medicine bag. Um, I came without mechanics tools, and well, that's not 100% true. I've got a, a wrench and ratchet set but uh, it's, the case is closed, and I'm hoping not to open it the entire trip. And, uh, uh, you know, what can I do without those tools? If one of you were to have a flat tire, and uh, I were to stop to help you change it, you'd have to supply the tools. Chances are I won't have the lug wrench, uh, or the, the jack or the other tools that could um, be used to help you out. And so, why did I come here, and what really can I do? Well, let's start at the beginning. Let's go all the way to the book of Genesis, and that word means beginnings. Let's go back to the book of beginnings. And uh, there we read about the Creator, how that He said, let there be light. And you know what? There was light. And then uh, when it came to the water, the earth, the grass, and the gases, and gravity, let's say, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And then he said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered under one place, 
and let dry land appears. In each case, what we have is God spoke words, and it was so. In fact, pretty much of what we see, touch, smell, feel is real because of words, words that God spoke. And thus it is also with the plants and the saguaros. I just, I just love coming to this area and seeing the saguaros and traveling from the east, you know, keep glancing from side to side to spot the first saguaro. It, isn't that an amazing plant? Well, God said, and it was so. And likewise with the birds in the sky, sky, the creatures in the sea. These did not exist until God spoke words. And so they came into existence, and so they continue to this day. All the product of the Word of God's. And there, it's amazing what words can do, that is, the right words, especially the words that God speaks not only to bring things to life that have never been alive, but as in the New Testament now, Jesus said in John 5, verses 28 and 29, Marvel not at this, for the hour cometh in which all that are in the tombs shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good under the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil under the resurrection of judgment. The words of God are so powerful that unlike the surgeon or the nutritionist, the therapist, et cetera, et cetera, his words can bring dead people back to life. And there's another kind of life that Jesus previously mentioned there in John 5, in John, the fifth chapter, if you back up to verse 25, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour cometh and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. And the, the great significance of that life is those who receive the spiritual life through the Word of God are exempt from the second death. And the death that we, we know, uh, well, we, we, we see it secondhand, and one of these days we experience it personally, but that's bad enough, isn't it? In fact, uh, this is sort of a reunion and sort of a memorial to me. I'll be thinking of the people who aren't here anymore, people in this congregation who I've loved over the years dearly. And, and physical death, the separation of spirit and body, that's bad enough, but the second death... That's the one we especially want to miss out on. And the Word of God can keep us alive from that second death. And words are such powerful things in so many ways. And I, I want to just give you some idea of the power of words right now. I can't do with my words what God can do with His words, but I can do it on a smaller scale. So think about this. And I don't know if all the kids are in the class, but kids, if any kids are here, I want you to think about how big is your brain? Maybe the size of a grapefruit. Did you know that I can take a giant pink and purple polka dotted elephant and I can put that huge critter into your brain? And you know how I can do it? I just, in fact, I just did it. I put that huge pink, purple, polka dotted elephant into your brain, and I did it through words. So never underestimate what words can do. But that, that's nothing. The Word of God can take this huge red dragon that is so big and so ferocious that one swipe of his tail can knock a third of the stars out of the sky. And the Word of God, you see, does that very thing in Revelation 12. And your first impression is a dragon that fierce and that big, that powerful, if he's going to gobble up a little baby boy as soon as he's born, the baby has no chance whatsoever. But the Word of God can put into your mind 
the fact that that dragon is mean, as vicious, as huge, as powerful as he was, he couldn't destroy that baby boy. And then the vision can show maybe a hypothetical. I don't know if it ever literally happened or not, but that dragon, he's, he's going to follow the man-child up into heaven. Because unless he can overthrow heaven itself, what that baby was born here to ultimately accomplish, it's, it's a done deal unless the dragon can overthrow heaven itself. And we have that in chapter 12 and, and the plan, diabolical plans in th chapters 13 and 14 of Revelation, how that as vicious as that dragon is, he uses these other monsters to accomplish his purposes. And so both at the end of Revelation 12 and then later on when the book talks about Armageddon, is the devil with all of his monsters and all of his forces doing battle against Jesus, the Son of God. And you wonder, whoa, this is the mother of all battles. This is the Waterloo of all time, so to speak. I wonder which side is going to win. Except the little children don't wonder. Ask them, say, now the devil and Jesus are having this war. Which side's going to win? And they'll say, Jesus, Jesus. The little children know. And you say, well, well, which side should I be on? You know, this dragon is mean, he's vicious, he's threatening. So which side should I be on? Should I be on the, the devil's side or the side of Jesus? And the little children know. And without hesitation, they'll tell you so. You need to be on the side of Jesus. You see, the word of God does reach the hearts and the minds of even little children. And that's not all. Did you know that God's words can cause you to see the most amazing thing that ever happened on this planet? Paul is writing to some folks. It's different congregations in the region back then that was called Galatia. Hundreds of miles and more away, decades after the fact, Paul had preached and now is writing a letter to those people. And in Galatians 3, verse 1, he says, Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was openly set forth crucified. They could see something that had happened decades before. And hundreds, if not well over a thousand miles away, they could see Jesus upon the cross and him crucified. And uh, and they knew why. Through words. And you know what? It's even a lot further from uh, Jerusalem to Tucson than it is to those places in Galatia. And of course, we're living many centuries later than even they did. But today, God's words can put before your eyes Jesus and Him crucified. That's the power of words, especially the Word of God. And when it comes to the fact that this is often in the form of testimony, God would put His words into the mouths of people, spokesmen, who had, as humans, witnessed firsthand the things that they document. Like, they were, there were those who actually saw Jesus upon that cross and crucified, they saw him die, and then afterwards they saw how that he was alive again. And God's word has come through these witnesses. But what about me? You know, even Thomas would say, here, poke your finger in this scar where the nail was in my hands. You, you can trust your old, whole fist into the side where the, the Roman spear ripped it open. And uh, how, do, how can we have what even Thomas had what Peter and the others had. Well, listen to a minute as John, and he's speaking here the Word of God when he says in 1 John 5, verses 9 and 10, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For the witness of God is this, that he hath borne witness concerning his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in him. 
Think of the significance. We who are not wish witnesses actually have the witness in us. And how is that? By words, the testimony that God gives. The words of witnesses can give you exactly what the first-hand witnesses had. Listen to what John himself said at the beginning of the epistle we call 1 John. In verses 3 and 4, John speaking in the, with the editorial we, he and the other apostles, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye may also have fellowship with us. Yea, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus. And these things we write that our joy or your joy may be made full. In other words, we can have the same joy that the apostles did and the other eyewitnesses. I was talking to some folks yesterday over there at uh, Alamogordo, New Mexico. I taught a men's training class there and it was about song leading. And uh, I suggested uh, the song leader needs to vet the song before he leads others to make sure that it is really accurate and scriptural. And I said, more often they are than sometimes brethren think because, you know, sometimes we don't understand poetic language and such. Many of the songs are really brilliant, like that song, uh, I Come to the Garden Alone. That song used to bother me when I was a kid. And I thought, that, you know, that writer's taking much too, liber uh, too much liberty. And the old Calvinist idea, I have this better felt than told feeling. And, and here the, the, the person, the narrator of the song is the joy we share as we tarry there is none other has ever known. And like, you know, the experience I have is better than the experience of you other guys. But then to realize that the songwriter was talking about Mary Magdalene. And out of all people, she was the first human being to see the Son of God raised from the dead. Peter and the other, many people had seen him die, and even a number of people were discovering that the tomb was empty. But she saw Jesus alive from the dead. And so, when, when uh, speaking on her behalf, the, the songwriter says, the joy we share as we tarry there, her and Jesus, Nobody has ever experienced anything like that, except now many people have. The same joy that Mary Magdalene had in seeing the resurrected Jesus, the same joy Peter had, John had, and these others, through the witness being in us, we experience joy like that too. But, but how? It was through the Word of God. The Word of God, you see, is so important to us having joy and fellowship and, yes, even salvation through eternity. And so it is that Peter himself, in 2 Peter 1, verse 2, says, uh, Simon Peter, servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them who have obtained a like precious faith with us. And so, yeah, Peter saw Jesus. He, he heard Jesus speaking directly. But he's writing to other people who have a faith just like and just as precious as the faith that he and others have. Again, how? Through words. The Word of God is so precious and powerful and important. Now, let me take you back again in time. Look at it another way. One time, water covered the whole face of the earth. I don't know if Kitt Peak, uh, that's where the observatory is, if that's the highest elevation, but the highest peak of the highest mountain, right? every one of them covered in water. And likewise, globally. And how could such a phenomenon possibly happen? Water was gushing up out of the ground. Water was falling from the sky. I don't know if the molecular structure of, uh, of the... the uh, the elements in the skies were altered to where, you know, instead of uh, it being with uh, well, the various gases that the uh, hydrogen and oxygen uh, combined to form water, but it was unprecedented and the like has not occurred since. How could such a thing as that happen? Well, Peter says it's because of the Word of God. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 through 10, if you want to turn over there, we'll be reading 
uh, about five or six verses. And this is talking about the experts. When he says, for they, the experts, they willfully forget that there were heavens from of old and an earth compacted out of water and in the midst of water by the word of God. That's creation there. By which means, that is the word of God, same word of God, by which means the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens that now are and the earth by the same word, same word means the word of God, by the same word have been stored up for fire, being reserved against the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But forget not this one thing, beloved, that, uh, excuse me, I, I'm getting, yeah, forget not this one thing, beloved, that one day is with God as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall be dissolved with fervent heat and the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So God's word said that the flood would never occur again. You remember that? I think at the end of Genesis 9. But the word of God also says that it'll be destroyed and completely destroyed and with it the atmosphere and with it the entire universe. And what can make such a thing really come to pass? Well, the word of God. It's as good as done, we might say, because God's word says it will happen. The part kids about like a thief means sneaky at a time that's unexpected. And none of the ones who set the day that the universe is going to end and the Lord will return, none of them know. They're just pretending. Uh, God has said it's going to happen. His word has not disclosed to us when. And really what Peter tells them for the rest of the chapter, that is 2 Peter chapter 3, he said the, the only way to be ready is to be always ready. S simple, simple process really. And that brings us then to a classic statement in Deuteronomy 29. I believe it's verse 29. I think I have a typo there. But uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, we're told, The secret things belong unto Jehovah our God, but the things that are revealed uh, belong unto us and to our children uh, forever, that we may do all the words of this law. In other words... Why write a book about something when, if the intent is, well, nobody can understand the book? Why bother writing a book? Anybody that writes a book is going to convey some information. Now, maybe there's some things that are redacted or some things that aren't put in the book. Why? Because, you know, it's confidential, top secret, classified, whatever. But anything that's in the book is so that the reader will be informed. And God has done that, and people make a, try to make a mockery of him and his word by saying, oh, yeah, it's all in there, but, you know, he, he presented it in such a way that you can't understand it. Well, why did he bother to write the book then? That's ludicrous, even on the surface. Uh, there is one case in Revelation 10, verse 4. John is kind of like a, a, a reporter. He's witnessing visions and hearing things and writing them down. Just scribbling them down, like, I don't know if he had shorthand or not, but writing down things as quickly as they were occurring. And at one point, uh, Revelation 10, verse 4, the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. So there's, there, there's something at least left out of the book of Revelation. Why was the rest of it written down? And why was it, it's like a scroll that you, you finish it and you don't even put a seal on it. You run and, and deliver it to these churches, uh, everyone. Uh, they don't even have time to break open the seals they need to read. Why? Because what's written in them 
is important and they needed to, to read and understand. That's the purpose for written, written documents. The things that have been dis divinely disclosed are to be understood. And uh, so there's something important in this book, the words of God that we have. And we need to try to figure out what the message is in each case. Finally, you're being a patient group. What time do you usually uh, dismiss this particular segment? At the bottom of the hour? Or? 6, 9.45. Nine, okay, so we have a few more minutes. I'd like for you to turn uh, in the New Testament to 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, and we'll read from verse 6 onward. This is a very definitive disclosure of how the inspiration process works. And I'm sure Brendan has referred to this uh, text already a number of times. It is so important for us to understand. When Paul, speaking on behalf of the inspired uh, uh, speakers and writers, said, We speak wisdom, however, among them that are full grown, yet a wisdom not of this world, nor of the rulers of this world who are coming to naught, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, even the wisdom that hath been hidden, which God foreordained before the worlds unto our glory, which none of the rulers of this world hath known. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, things which eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, and which entered not into the heart of man. And Henry Ford, I think, uh, was it Henry Ford? No, Thomas Edison gave us the picture. You know, you can draw an ear, you can draw an eye, and then that, that light bulb, you know, that light bulb has become the icon for ideas, invented ideas. Nobody thought of that before, but I did, and I'm, I'm going uh, I'm to patent and design this new invention. So nobody observed it scientifically. Nobody heard it. Nobody invented the idea. And, uh, well, how do we come up with it if uh, we can't see it, hear it, or imagine it? Well, what if God reveals it to us? Which entered not into the heart of man, um, whatsoever things God prepared for them that love him. Verse 10 in second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. Um, but unto us God revealed them through the Spirit, and the us would be the inspired men. Inspired men, inspired by the Spirit, they receive words. And uh, unto them God revealed through the Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And then he goes on to make a logical argument. Who among men knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so the things of God none knoweth, save the Spirit of God. But we receive not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is from God, that we might uh, know the things that were freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Spirit teacheth. Uh, and the uh, American Standard Version wording, I believe, gets to the point. At the end of verse uh, 13, 1 Corinthians 2, 13, combining spiritual things with spiritual words. And let me just go off on a brief tangent. One of the interesting traits of the New Testament is how often uh, adjectives are used without stating the noun. But you know, adverbs modify verbs. They describe action. Adjectives describe thing, or person, place, or thing. But what if we have the modifier of a noun, but not the noun? And this is one of those cases. So some versions would be, uh, uh, it, it, usually it's in italics if it's applied. You know, we're talking about spiritual things, spiritual men, spiritual words, what? Well, I think the American Standard got the right idea contextually. Spiritual, uh, spiritual things with spiritual words. And this is the nature of this book. Not only did the Holy Spirit reveal ideals to the writers and speakers, the Holy Spirit gave them the words they were to use to convey these ideals. 
That's what makes this, uh, th this book so unique. I'm going to try to do my best to minimize faux pas and inaccuracies in my speaking. But see, you still have to go back and, and vet everything I say, even if my motives are completely pure, even if I've got it up here, it could, it could still come out. Practically every preacher that I've ever known has had uh, Moses taking two of every kind of animals into the ark. And you know, well, everybody knows it's Noah, and the preacher does too, but sometimes the wrong word or name comes out. Uh, that doesn't happen with this book. That's why this book is so reliable. Both the intended ideals are pure and valid, and the words used to express those words are precise and accurate. And so this is inspiration, the Holy Spirit giving the, the writer, the speaker, both the ideas and the words to use. Verses 14 and 15, now the natural, that's the old word for physical. The Greek word for physical is what is in this verse. The physical man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot know them because they are spiritually judged or spiritually discerned. And, you know, even the goose. The goose knows to head north a certain time of year and then to head back south at a different time. It's instinctive. It's inborn in them. There's all sorts of things that animals have that, that's just inborn, inbred. I don't even know the term for it. But they just naturally, instinctively know. And the same is true with humans. But there are some things that we won't know instinctively. We can only know if they are revealed to us from God. That's what this book is for. The things in this book that we're not going to get any other way. We're not born with it. We don't inherit it from our parents. It doesn't matter if, you know, dad's a preacher or uncle, our great uncle or great granddad. Uh, these things aren't inherited physically, naturally. They're only uh, available through the word of God. And then we have to hear and accept those words. So um, we're not mind readers. We can't just second guess what God is thinking, but we are word readers. And so Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 and 11, um, as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and cometh not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it to bring forth and bud and giveth seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper the thing wherein I said it. And what especially pleases God is when his word showers upon your heart and it germinates, it buds, it produces the right kind of fruit. The word of God can do that. So think finally of a precious stuff being hauled by train. And that's what... That's what really put places like Tucson and so many places in the southwest on the map. It got to where Tucson would have ice. The, the, the trains could bring in ice. They could bring in bananas and things from way down in central, if I'm pointing the right way. <laughs> things that otherwise, you know, nobody had access to. And so all of these goodies, it could even be a zoo train, the circus come into town and bring all these exotic animals. And, uh, well, think of the uh, a sentence as being a train. Think of each car as being a word in that sentence. You've got the elephant car, you've got the tiger car, maybe even the banana car, all these things strung together. And so God is sending this train from his mind to your mind. Isn't that amazing that in your mind can be the very thing that's on God's mind? How? Words. Words from God conveying the things of his mind to your mind. Words are important, are they not? And so I didn't bring carpenter's tools. I didn't bring uh, mechanic's tools for the most part. But I bring the word of God. In conclusion, I direct your minds to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, a passage that we, we understand and appreciate some of the concepts involved, but I think most of the time we have not really focused our camera to see the precise meaning. 
as we're reading this, I want you to keep in mind that I can't get up on your roof with this and patch the leak. I can't get out of my car and go to your car with this and change your flat tire. With that in mind, think about 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And I'll probably just be morphing uh, different versions here. All scripture inspired of God is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for, no, I left out reproof, I think, for uh, doctrine, I'm, I'm, I'm having a senior moment right now. But anyway, we've got the reproof, we've got the correction, and we've got the instruction which is in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. I hope that God looks down and sees me as the man of God. And no disrespect intended, I'm not thoroughly equipped to change your flat tire with this. I'm not thoroughly equipped to patch your leaky roof. But as a man of God, whose job is to speak the word of God, this is it. And I don't need any university. I don't need any religious degree conferred. I don't need any permission from any other human being to be thoroughly equipped by this to do my work and do it completely. And that is my aim. And that is my goal for the next few days. Stick around, show up again, and see if I manage to pull that awesome responsibility off. Uh, the simplicity of the gospel, I bring to you nothing brand new but the old-timey message that's been around the Word of God for a long time now. Thank you very much.